Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah Reads here, and welcome to Chapter 2 of Brad Thor's Backlash. I'm probably going to do Chapter 2 and 3 today, just because in one video, because Chapter 2 is kind of short. <clears throat> chapter 2, Governor's Island, Lake Winnipesaukee, Guilford, New Hampshire. Police Chief Tom Tullis had seen plenty of dead bodies over his career, but this was a record for him at a single crime scene. During the height of the summer, the popular resort town of Guilford could swell to as many as 20,000 inhabitants. Off-season like thou, the number of full-time residents was only 7,300. Either way, four corpses were four too many. Pulling out his cell phone, the tall, crew-cut sporting cop texted his wife. They were supposed to meet for lunch. That was impossible now. He told her not to expect him for dinner, either. It was going to be a late night. Returning the phone to his duty belt, he focused on the bodies. Two men and two women. They all had all been shot either in the head, the chest, or both. Judging from a quick scan of the walls and windows, no rounds had missed their targets. That told them the shooter was skilled. Interestingly, three of the four victims were armed. One of the women had a Sig Sauer P365 in her purse, and the other a Glock 17 in her briefcase. The other two men carried a Heckler and, Co a Heckler and Cock pistol at his hip. Now, no, no one had drawn their weapons. That told Tull something else. Either the victims had known their killer, or they'd all been taken by surprise. Considering who the victims were, he doubted it was the latter. The woman with the Sig Sauer had credentials identifying her as a former, bo former Boston police detective, eligible to carry concealed nationwide. The woman with the Glock had no such credentials, but in the fi live free or die state of New Hampshire was legal to carry without a permit. Not that she would ever have trouble getting one. Seeing the name on her driver's license, Tulsa had instantly recognized her. She had made a lot of headlines when the president had elevated her to deputy director of the CIA. The gun-carrying male had, a, had an ID that claimed he was an active military member, United States Navy. What the hell were they all doing here, the chief wondered, and who had killed them. He suspected the key might be with the final victim. Just off the dining room, facing a large TV, a hospital bed had been set up in the den. In it, shot once between the eyes, was a man who appeared to be somewhere in his 80s. He was the only victim Tullus and the team had ident hadn't yet identified. The chief had some decisions to make. Judging from the post-mortem lividity of the bodies, they had been dead for at least two days, maybe more. The killer's trail would already be going cold. As a seasoned law enforcement officer, Tullus knew the importance of doing everything by the book. He needed to be secure not only the house, but also the grounds. Going the extra step, he decided to shut down the lone bridge that connected the 504-acre Governor's Island to the mainland and request marine patrol units over the shoreline. This wasn't some murder-suicide where the husband had shot the wife on the pool board before turning the gun on himself. It wasn't some drug deal gone bad. This was a high-profile case, exactly the kind of case this town never wanted, especially a tourism-dependent town like Guilford. Getting on the radio, the chief had told the dispatcher to send the entire shift. He then instructed her to call in available off-duty officers. They were going to need as much manpower as possible. The next step was to alert the state attorney general's office in Concord. Per protocol, they would mobilize a major crime unit team from the state police to come and lead the investigation. Before he made that call, though, he needed to place another. It wasn't to buy the book move. In fact, Tullis was way overstepping his authority. But if it meant protecting Guilford and the town's hardworking men and women so dependent on the tourist trade, it was one scenario in which the chief was willing to bend the rules. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3, Laconia Municipal Airport, Guilford, New Hampshire. When the call came to Langley, the director of the Central Intelligence, Bob McGee, happened to be in a meeting with the director of FBI, Gary Mintelin. Militante. Though the DCI's assistant was hesitant to interrupt, she knew she had to make her boss aware of the call. McGee put it on speakerphone. He and Militante were stunned by what they heard. The FBI director introduced himself, gave Tullis his personal cell phone number, and asked to be texted as many pictures of the crime scene as possible. Pictures of the bodies, the IDs, the weapons, all of it. Minutes later, his phone began vibrating. As the photos turned in, McGee kept his emotions in check. With professional detachment, he narrated to the... Narr With professional detachment, he narrated who and what they were looking at, right down to the body in the hospital bed. Retired CIA operative Reed Carlton, the man who had founded the agency's counterterrorism center. Militante had the same questions as Tullis. What were they all doing in New Hampshire, and who would, who would have wanted them dead? 
It was a long story, which, which McGee promised to explain in flight. He wanted to look at the crime scene for himself, and the only way he'd have any legal access to it was with the FBI attached. Before he and Militante could leave, though, there was an additional person he needed to reach. He tried three times, but his calls all ended up in voicemail. Why the hell wasn't he picking up? After sending a quick text, McGee grabbed his jacket and headed downstairs with the FBI director and the security details for a two-minute ride to the 84VA, the agent's helipad, agency's helipad, a mile west of Langley. Once they had boarded their respective helicopters, it was a short flight to Joint Base Andrews, where an, Emper, an Embraer Praetor 600 was fueled and waiting. The jet was a recent addition to the CIA's fleet. Fast and able to make off using less than 500,000 feet of runway, it was perfect for the trip to Guilford. When they landed, a phalanx of SUVs was waiting for them. The detail leaders hated movements like this. No warning, no planning, and little to no coordination with elements on ground. Nevertheless, both directors had insisted that the trip was necessary and the time was of the essence. From Laconia Municipal, it was only four miles to Governor's Island. They were met at airport by Guilford PD and given an escort through town and over the bridge to the crime scene. Stepping out of one of the SUVs, McGee took a deep breath. The air was cold and smelled of pine. A hint of wood smoke drifted from the chimney somewhere unseen. McGee looked like, mar looked like a marshal from an old western. He was a tall man in his late fifties with gray hair and a gray mustache. A statement to his army career, his shoes were shined and his suit was immaculate and his shirt was crisply pressed. He wore no jewelry other than a Rolex Submariner, a gift to himself when he left the Delta Force decades ago and was signed on to the CIA's paramilitary branch. McGee was old school, known for being tough, direct, and unflappable. He hated politics, and which made him a good choice to head the CIA. The nation's once proud intelligence service was being choked to death by bureaucracy. It was packed with talented people willing to give everything for their country, but they were held back by risk-averse middle managers more concerned with the next promotion than with doing what needed to be done. Familiar with the agency from the ground up, the president had put McGee in charge of cleaning out the dead wood, and he had gone after it root and branch. But McGee had quickly realized that mucking out the agency's organ stables was a Herculean task, one that was going to take much longer than any of them had envisioned. In the meantime, the threats against America were growing, becoming deadlier, more destabilizing, more intricate. As red tape slowed Langley down, America's enemies were speeding up. Something had to, needed to be done. Something radical. With the president's approval, McGee had agreed to a bold new plan, as well as a major sacrifice. The plan was to outsource the CIA's most clandestine work. It would go to a private intelligence agency outside the bureaucracy's grasp. There, safe from government red tape, sensitive operations could receive the support and commitment they deserved. It was viewed as a temporary fix while Langley was undergoing gut rehab, mm -hmm. a rehab that would go all the way down to the studs. A private intelligence agency charged with taking over the darkest slice of the CIA's pie was the Carlton Group, founded by the aforementioned, now deceased, Reed Carlton. And as to McGee's sacrifice, it was personified by another victim at the scene. With his blessing, Lydia Ryan had left the position as CIA Deputy Director in order to run the Carlton Group. That was the backdrop against which Bob McGee stepped out of the SUV, breathed in the chilly New England air, and prepared himself for the horror that he was about to see inside. Tellus met the two directors at the front steps and solemnly shook their hands. Then, after having, to, having them, sign to them sign into the crime scene log, he distributed paper booties and latex glove. The protection details didn't get any. They would have to wait outside. The fewer people coming in and out, the better. The police chief was about to show the men inside when one of his officers came up carrying a clear plastic evidence bag. <clears throat> we found something in the back of the trees near the end of the driveway, the patrolman said, holding it up. Inside was a phone. McGee recognized it immediately. Or more specifically, he recognized its case. Made from a single, rigid thermoplastic, the distinct Magpul cell phone case was popular with military operators. Its styling mimicked the company's ru rugged rifle magazines. On the back, a distinct Nordic symbol had been customized. The chief stepped off the porch for a closer examination. As he did, the FBI director saw the look in the CIA colleague's face. Slowly, he mouthed to the name, Harvath. McGee nodded. 
their bad situation had gotten worse. End of chapter 3, and end of this video. Next time, we'll be back with chapter 4.